Hello everybody. In this video we're going to be covering section 12.1 chemical reaction rates. For our learning objectives we're going to define chemical reaction rates. We're going to learn how to derive rate expressions from balanced equations given a chemical reaction. And we're going to calculate reaction rates from experimental data. First thing we need to talk about is what exactly is a rate. A rate is a measure of how some property varies, how it's changing, with time. A familiar example is speed. This is the rate that distance is traveled uh, given an amount of time. Another familiar rate would be weight. This is the rate at which you're paid and you earn money uh, given the amount of time that you've worked. The rate of a chemical reaction is a measure of how much reactant is consumed <clears throat> and how much product is produced. Remember that these two are tied as reactants are consumed. We pr we're producing uh, products uh, given the, a certain amount of time. Now, in, in general, we're going to have to measure concentrations in order to uh, decide how much reactant is consumed or products are produced. And we have to remember that we can't just see mo molecules. We can't just count the reactants and products directly. So we have to have some sort of handle. We have to have another property that's going to be related to these values, either uh, mass or moles or concentration of these components. A couple of examples of this would be if we had a gas evolution reaction and we were able to measure the volume, temperature, and pressure over time, then we could figure out how many moles of gas has been produced. We could measure the mass from a precipitation reaction, and then if we knew the molar mass, we'd be able to figure out how many moles of precipitate has been formed. If we had a colored reactant or product, so we have a colored solution, uh, we could measure the absorbance of it using spectrophotometry, and we'd be able to relate that back to concentration. And we could do the same sort of thing with conductivity if either of the reactants or products are uh, conductive. There's a whole bunch of other uh, tools that we can use for this purpose. Some of them are even more generalized. I, I got a little list here. We've got NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. We've got mass spectrometry. We've got gas chromatography paired with flame ionization detection high-performance liquid chromatography, inductively coupled plasma with optical emission spectroscopy. There's a whole host of tools that are used to determine the quantities of different chemicals. Um, some are better than others at this task, uh, depending on exactly what kind of sample you have. A big distinction that we need to make is between the average and the instantaneous rate. Um, and I think the best way to think about this is in a, with an example. So let's say you're driving your car to the store 10 miles away, and it takes you 20 minutes to drive there. Your average rate of speed is the distance you traveled divided by the time. So it, it's 10 miles away. It took me 20 minutes. That means I was going half a mile a minute. Or if we convert this to something that we're more familiar with, 30 miles per hour. But when you take this trip to the store, you're not always going 30 miles an hour, right? You sped up to get to 30 miles, you slowed down to park, uh, maybe you hopped on the highway for a second and you were going quite a bit faster. Uh, your rate of travel at any one of these times would have been your instantaneous rate of speed. And it would have been <coughs> higher or lower than your average. And reaction rates work the same way. The average rate is found by dividing the change in the concentration by the time this change occurred, okay, just like we did for our average rate of speed. The instantaneous rate may be different at any given moment. We have a special case here. We have the instantaneous rate at time zero is called the initial rate. Okay, so just like the initial rate of your car is always going to be zero because it's sitting there parked, the initial rate of a chemical reaction isn't necessarily going to be zero. Okay, it's going to start off actually producing uh, and maybe have the highest rate that it's going to have during the entire course. <clears throat> Calculating initial and instantaneous rates properly requires calculus or sophisticated numerical methods. 
but we can make a lot of approximation using graphical methods or by using very small time intervals. So if we take the average rate and we make the time interval very, very small, it's going to start to approximate the instantaneous rate. Let's talk a little bit about how we write rate. Uh, the rate of a reaction. So the change in species over time is the rate expression. If we have an example here where we have the decomposition of uh, hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, the rate of decomposition of the hydrogen peroxide is going to equal negative, and it's negative because the uh, it's being consumed, all right, the change in concentration of the reactant over the time interval. So we have the amount of hydrogen peroxide that we have at some time in the future, so our final bit that we want to measure, okay, minus the initial amount of uh, the initial concentration of the hydrogen peroxide, okay. So as it's being consumed, that means that this is going to be larger than this, right? It's always being consumed, so this, as we go forward into future times, this value is always going to be smaller. This difference is going to be negative, and this negative here ensures that our rate is always a positive value, and that's the big takeaway here. Our rate is always going to be a positive value. We have the difference in those two times, okay? And then we're going to rewrite that using our delta notation, okay, where we have the change in the hydrogen peroxide concentration over the change in time. Numerically, that looks a little something like this. So what we're doing is we're always taking the difference here. So I have uh, at time two here, I have half a molar solution of hydrogen peroxide. I'm going to subtract this minus the initial amount, and I'm going to get that negative value that we talked about. Okay, and then I'm going to go to the next one, and I'm going to subtract that from the previous one. I'm going to get another negative value, so on and so forth. Okay, these are all now my changes in uh, hydrogen peroxide. As far as the time, we're going to do the exact same thing, but we've set this up such that we're doing this every six hours. Okay, so our change there is always going to be six. We take this value, divide it by that value, we apply that negative sign that we talked about, and we get these average rates as we go along. And we see that as we go along, the average rate is going down um, as we consume the hydrogen peroxide, and we have less of a push for the reaction to move forward. We have to get really comfortable with graphs here. They're really your friends, okay? Um, if we graph the concentration versus time, all right, then what we can do now is we can always pick out the concentration at some time interval and the concentration at some time interval and then calculate the average between those two points. Um, and the tangent line, if you guys aren't familiar with this, this is a line that only touches the curve at that one little point all right, is going to be uh, the instantaneous rate at any given time, all right? The slope of that line is going to be the instantaneous rate, I should say. So we need to figure out how much it rise, uh, rose, divide that by how much it ran, and then we're going to be able to get the instantaneous rate at any given point. And this is where calculus would come in. We would be able to get a... Uh, a value for that using calculus if we knew what kind of function this was so we could fit a function to it. But graphical methods also work can work just as well for this. Um, let's talk about how we do relative rates, okay? Because what we want to be able to do is write rate expressions for any one of the components in our reaction, all right? Uh, the rate of a reaction may be expressed as the change in concentration of any reactant or product. The rate expressions are related simply to one another according to reaction stoichiometry. Okay, so we have to come back to the stoichiometry here. In this simple example where we have A moles of A to produce B moles of B, um, 
what we're going to do is we're going to put that negative sign again in front of any of the reactants. We're not going to have a negative sign in front of any of the products. We're going to make a fraction out of this coefficient. We're going to make a fraction out of this coefficient. And then we're going to have that change of concentration over change of time. And all of these are going to be equal to the rate. Uh, I want to consider a little example here so you can see if we make this a little bit more complicated how this plays out and why this is all true. So let's consider the example of decomposition of ammonia. We've got two ammonia molecules produce one nitrogen molecule plus three hydrogen molecules. The average rate of the reaction uh, in terms of the nitrogen gas is going to be the change in moles of nitrogen divided by the time, right? Because there's only a one here. So we don't have to consider any kind of fraction. It's a product, so it's not uh, negative or anything like that. So we can start here. Let's see if we can prove to ourselves that the that rate is equal to the other ones. So what we can do here is exactly the same sort of thing that we uh, did with the stoichiometry when we were talking about um, stoichiometric coefficients and figuring out the moles that were being produced before. We just multiply by the stoichiometric co uh, stoichiometric ratios here, okay? We know that we have two moles of ammonia being consumed for every one mole of nitrogen being consumed. And so we can just do that, cancel our moles of nitrogen, and then we have the change in moles of ammonia over the time. The only thing that's different is that we need to make sure that we apply this negative sign to any one of the uh, reactants. Okay, so because ammonia is a reactant, we're going to also have to have this negative sign here. If we rewrite that, we get that expression. We see that the, the change in uh, the moles of uh, nitrogen is equal to uh, the expression that we had before. Okay, where we have this 1 over 2 here. So we get 1 over the coefficient in front of the ammonia. And we can do the exact same thing for the hydrogen and rewrite that, where again, now we have that one over the, uh, one over the um, stoichiometric coefficient of hydrogen, okay? Here we do not need the negative sign because back here, that is a product and products don't get negative signs, okay? Now that we know that these are all equal to each other, we can write the rate out as being all equal to one another. And a big takeaway that we have here is that these are all occupying the same volume. So rather than talking about the change of moles, we can talk about the change in concentration. All right. So, so long as these guys are all occupying the same volume, they're all in the same solution or the same vessel or something like that, we can interchange our rate expression with the change in moles and the change in concentration. They're all going to be equal to each other. Okay. Uh, finally, we can take a look at this and look at the rates of these uh, graphically. All right, we can see that we see the slowing of the rate as we approach our equilibrium point where the, the rate of the forward reaction is going to be equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. And we can see that our products are being produced, so they have these positive slopes here. Okay, our ammonia is being consumed, right? And they all start to flatten out as we get out to the end, and they all were at, at the highest rates down here. Now you can notice that this one's climbing higher, right, than this one here. And that is a result of the stoichiometry. If we take a single slice of time right here, and we look at the tangent lines for at all these points, we can get all their instantaneous rates of reaction, all right? So if we take a look at the instantaneous rate of reaction of hydrogen production, we get this value right here. And if we take a look at the instantaneous rate of uh, production of the nitrogen, okay, we get this rate right here. And if we take the ratio of those two, we're going to get that three, okay? So that's uh, effectively taking uh, this guy and dividing it by this guy. 
uh, and then you're going to be able to see that it's producing it three times faster and that's why we have this higher curve here than we do for the nitrogen.